Hi, good afternoon, everyone. We're so happy that you're joining us today. And to kick us off, we have the head of our amazing paid family and medical leave authority, Andrea Barton Reeves. So good morning, everyone. I am Andrea Barton Reeves. I am the CEO of Connecticut's Paid Leave Authority, and I'm really delighted that you're here today. The last time that I addressed you about the Paid Leave Authority, I was speaking to you about the number of employers that had registered and how much money we had collected at the end of the first quarter. And today I'm here because I'm really pleased to report that we've reached another milestone in the standing up of the agency. The application process for paid leave benefits opens today, December 1st. And I can tell you, oh, thank you. And I can tell you that as of noon, I did just get a text that tells me exactly where we are in terms of statistics. I can get my phone to cooperate. We, as of noon, we had 457 people who had called, filing 183 claims. 33% of those claims are for bonding. 6% is for caring for a family member. 19% is for the person's own serious health condition. And 42% are for those parents that are expecting their first child. So this is as of 8.30 today, so we're very excited. We've had very few issues or problems, and people really are taking advantage and availing themselves of a benefit that the Connecticut people and workers pay for. So today, this would not have happened unless there were a number of people that I need to thank for what has occurred. But first, let me tell you, there are five ways to apply. They are online, by phone, by fax, by email, and by US mail because the one thing we wanted to do is to make sure that everyone who was paying for it had an accessible way to apply for their benefits, which will start to be paid in January of 2021. And we at the Paid Leave Authority have so many we need to thank for the success that we're celebrating today. We'd first like to acknowledge the Paid Leave Authority team and of course the governor of our state, Ned Lamont. Thank you. <laughs> Lieutenant Governor Bicewitz, our board of directors, Senator Kushner and Representative Porter, United Way and all of our state agency partners, including the Department of Administrative Services that helped us get up and running, the Office of the Treasurer, the Office of the State Controller, the Connecticut Insurance Department, the Department of Labor, Revenue Service, and Economic Community and Community Development. We'd also like to thank our Claims Administration partner, AFLAC, who started with us in March and has us up and running in December, which is almost unheard of. They have been an extraordinary partner to help make this day possible for the people of the state of Connecticut. So thank you. So before I introduce the governor, I'd like to introduce Claire, who is the owner of Claire's Cornucopia. Claire has been, thank you, Claire. Claire, would you please come on up? Claire has been a wonderful supporter of paid leave and she's been so gracious to allow us to use her space today. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. This is a blessing. This is a wonderful day for children. This is a wonderful day for families. This is a wonderful day for America. I mean, we are the only state, well, except I guess New Guinea, the only country that does not have this plan. And now we do. We're building our future. We're taking, and we're really helping responsible businesses because small businesses like me, who always try to do the right thing, it's difficult to pay people for staying home when they need to. And we've done it, and it's been really hard. And now it's not gonna be as difficult. So I want to say thank you so much, and this is wonderful. Thank you. And now I would like to invite the Honorable Ned Lamont to the podium, who has been a staunch supporter of paid family medical leave and has supported our agency and its success from the very beginning. Governor? I'll give you just a little bit of how these things evolved. I mean, remember back in the 90s and Chris Dodd, Senator Dodd, putting in place uh, family leave, medical leave. Then we moved forward. Rosa thinking hard about paid family and medical leave. Some of those discussions uh, happened right here, right, Claire? Right at that Every table, table, right at that <laughs> table. And now uh, Connecticut, one of the very first states in the country to have paid family and medical leave. It's one of those um, ideas whose time is coming. 
but it sort of sat around the legislature for a while, never quite had the impetus to get um, across the finish line until Julian Robin took the lead in the legislature and said, here we go. And um, there's no stopping this duo. And uh, it was the right thing to do. And uh, then you get this passed, and then it's a question of, well, how do you get it implemented? How do you get this job done? How do you get it done responsibly? How do you get it done promptly? How do you get it done with fiscal rectitude? And uh, there, uh, Josh Jabal and Andrea Barton Reeves and our friends from AFLAC took the lead. And uh, today, we are on board. People are signing up. It's under budget. It's ahead of schedule. And uh, that doesn't always happen in a uh, government. And um, it gives people confidence that we can make a difference uh, in folks' lives. Um, you know, Claire said, look, this is important for kids. It's important for parents. Uh, I love it because it's important for Connecticut and employers as well. I want to be the most family-friendly state in the country. I want people to know that one more reason you want to come to Connecticut is because uh, we treat uh, workers with respect. We a, put a big emphasis upon kids and make it easier for you to keep working. And I think as we found over this last year, over this last year of COVID, and my God, even um, even the White House had to offer um, some uh, paid leave during the worst of COVID for the federal employees. Uh, the rest of them are catching up with us. But I think it just reminds people how important it is as we try and get people back to work, give them confidence they get back to work, they can get back to work safely, they can do this now and know that they don't have to risk between a, a sick child or a sick parent or um, a pregnancy and work. You don't have to make that choice. We're able to do it both. That allows us to get back to work. That allows businesses to grow and expand. And it's the right thing for our kids. So. I just want to give a big shout out to uh, the paid family and medical leave team. It's 26 people as a small quasi starting this thing up from scratch. Uh, Andrea, you know, she's got an amazing background, spent some time in insurance, spent some time in legal, uh, spent some time at HARC and uh, an extraordinary background to put this uh, uh, together on a timely basis. I hope it makes as big a difference for people's lives as we dream it should. With that, who do I introduce? <laughs> My Lieutenant Governor Susan Bidor. Thank you. <laughs> Bob, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Today is such a great day because uh, so many people have worked so hard to see this program come to fruition. Um, you know, today people have already started applying as soon as the phone lines were open, the calls were coming in. And so many people called just in the first hour or so, I think it's indicative of the need that is out there. And the great thing is our state is leading the way with the best paid family law in the country, and today we start the process of implementation. Now, the governor mentioned um, that our state is uh, one of the most family-friendly states in the country, according to Wallet Hub. And one of the big reasons, there's a couple of reasons, one of the big reasons is because of this law also because we have a $15 an hour minimum wage that has helped uplift uh, 170,000 families headed by women in our state. And this program had some naysayers, but it's launching on time and under budget, and it currently has 123,000 735 registered businesses with over $300 million in contributions to help those who are going to apply. And it's so exciting because after COVID, which really put our state and our country into a she session, let's be honest, women and people of color were most impacted because women had to stay home to leave their jobs so that they could supervise their kids, take care of sick family members. So uh, that really underscored the need 
for this critical program, and it's why we're here so excited today to launch the very first day that people can get benefits that, by the way, and this should be really emphasized, that they've been paying for over the past year. This is not free. Everyone has been paying in so that anyone who needs the benefit can have access to it. And it was um, a long road and a struggle, but anything that's worthwhile takes tenacity, takes vision, takes hard work. And I'm really proud to stand here together with Senator Kushner and Representative Porter, who stood for hours on the floor of our General Assembly debating this and advocating so fiercely for. So we're so proud now that the people of Connecticut never have to choose between uh, taking care of themselves or a sick loved one or staying home with a new baby. And I'll just end on this very happy thought that earlier today we were with um, Caroline Simmons, the newly uh, minted mayor for the city of Stamford, who in a couple of months will be delivering her third child. And her mom said to me as we were waiting for the inauguration to start, she was looking forward to being able to figure out a family medical leave. So on that note, it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Josh Jabal, our COO of our state. Oh. I, okay, we've, we've changed the order. It's my great pleasure to introduce the President of the Senate, Senator Mark Looney. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Madam Lieutenant Governor, and thank you, Governor Lamont, uh, my legislative colleagues who are here. Uh, the paid family and medical leave bill was one of the, the two top priorities of the Senate Democratic Caucus in the 2019 session. This, along with the uh, the incremental increase in the paid minimum wage to $15 an hour. But as has been said, paid family and medical leave can be transformative in the lives of families who are operating on a very narrow margin, and in some cases, solidly middle class families as well, uh, who are facing deprivation and a terrible choice between being able to take care of a newborn child or a sick relative and the risk of losing a job. And that is something that should not be happening in any civilized nation. It does not happen in most nations that already have more enlightened policy than we have at the national level, but at least we will be doing it here at the state level. It is something that was a long time coming. Uh, it was so important for us. We know that in the, uh, the year now that uh, people have been contributing to the fund, there is now about $300 million um, in the fund. About 123,000 businesses have already signed up. Uh, we are aggressively uh, seeking more to, to do that. It is something that will be an important part of the social safety net uh, for the people of the state of Connecticut. And it is, so, it is so important because the level of fear, the level of anxiety, the level of deprivation, uh, and the level of being the, the concern about being faced with impossible choices uh, faces people who don't have this coverage and have gone without it for far too long. At least Connecticut now has joined uh, the number of enlightened states that have adopted this policy. And I want to especially thank uh, Senator Kushner uh, for her great leadership on this in the, in the state Senate. Uh, Representative Porter for her leadership in the House, uh, both of them bore the, the brunt of the debate uh, on the floor. Uh, I want to thank the, the governor for his leadership on this uh, uh, as well uh, and the celebration in, in signing the bill. Uh, but people sometimes wonder about what does government do or is this government significant? Can it have an impact? This is certainly one of the cases where it has and will. Uh, one of our colleagues from the other uh, party in a floor debate in the last session said that he looked forward to the day where the people of Connecticut would not have to pay any attention to what we do in Hartford because its role would be so limited that the role of government should be so limited and so restricted that it would have virtually no power. That's a day I hope we'll never see because this is a time when we need to step up. Government had to do this and it was so important and there is a role for government in enlightened so social policy and this is one of those times. Thanks very much. Here's Josh. <laughs> All right, good afternoon. I'm Josh Jabal. I uh, have the honor of uh, chairing the board of directors of the Paid Leave Authority. Um, but uh, as my day job as a chief operating officer for the state, I want to just comment uh, briefly on the operational significance and achievements of, of this team. So uh, a couple of statistics to, to put this in context. So there, there's uh, 
uh, it's pretty well known that uh, about 90% of new startups fail. Um, and when you look more specifically at the small number of states who've already implemented a paid leave program, uh, every single one of them have either had to delay their timeline, uh, run over budget, and or had to launch with a more limited set of benefits than was originally intended. And I say this not to be critical of those states, I say this only to point out that this is really hard. It's hard to start a new business, it's hard to stand up a new government program, it's hard to stand up a $400 million new government program with a very complex set of benefits that impacts almost every business in the state, almost every working person in the state. Um, but we are standing here today launching on time, under budget, with the full complement of services that the legislation uh, dictated, and doing so with extremely high quality. And we'll have some growing pains as we launch here, that's to be expected, but you will see that the services that this authority is providing are first class, they, the websites look great, the, the, all the services are, are fantastic. And so um, I just want to briefly acknowledge, I think, three main reasons uh, why this has been so successful. Um, first, I think it starts with the operational strategy, in particular the, the, the vision that the governor set out around wanting to do this as a quasi-public authority, enabling us to move a little faster, not have to be subjected to all the same requirements and red tape that we deal with in state government, also really embracing public-private partnerships to bring in talent and technology and process excellence, not have to reinvent the wheel ourselves, but really leverage the best of what the marketplace can bring to bear to help us to move quickly. The second real driver is the amazing support we've gotten from all of our stakeholders. We have a great board of directors. Uh, several of them are here today. If I could just ask them to raise their hands. I see Ava, I see Isha. I don't know if there's others here, but we've got a great board of directors. Our partners in the legislature have been phenomenal. Certainly Senator Kushner, Representative Porter, the driving forces here have been very active during the implementation phase as well, helping us at every step of the way. Senator Looney and all of our legislative partners have been amazing. The advocacy community, the business community, helping to educate the business community about what this means for them and, and how to help their employees uh, work through this. Um, so we've gotten great support from the advocates. Finally, and, and most importantly, it's about the staff at the authority. Um, and in particular, it's about Andrea Barton Reeves. She is, I have to say, she, uh, she, she is one of the most talented leaders I have ever worked with in my entire career. She is an absolute rock star. And she started less than two years ago with a board of directors, a pile of paper that was the legislation, and literally nothing else. She started from scratch, and in less than two years, she built a small but incredibly talented team. She orchestrated all of these uh, third-party relationships that we've relied on to stand up the authority, and she's become an incredibly powerful voice for what this program is about, how important this is to the people of Connecticut, and that we would not be here today without her. So I want to thank her for taking on this challenge. She didn't need to do this. It was a risky career move for her, but she's done an absolutely <laughs> phenomenal job. And so thank you, Andrea. Thank you. And our amazing state senator, Julie Kushner. Thank you all, and uh, it's so exciting to be here today to see this program move forward uh, very close to the day when someone will actually receive benefits, and that's only a month away. So it's incredibly exciting. You know, there are, you've already heard from people that were instrumental in getting this program up and running. Uh, there's been talk about myself and my co-chair, my great friend Robin Porter, but frankly, there were people working on this for eight years before I even got to the legislature. Right. And I want to say something about the Coalition for Connecticut Paid Leave because that coalition was the backbone of the movement that gave us the leverage and the power to pass this bill in 2019. And they guided us every step of the way so that we wouldn't uh, fail to provide the kind of program that we want here in Connecticut. And it was very intense especially as a new legislator, uh, being on the floor of the Senate and defending this bill. It was challenging, it was intense, but it probably wasn't the most moving moment uh, in my experience. My experience was the public hearings. That's where I felt the stories of the workers and the families that had gone without paid leave and what that meant to them 
the loss of jobs, the loss of income, the, the need to pick between taking care of a loved one and your paycheck. And those stories, and I remember one person very clearly, Denitra Pearson, who was pregnant and she spoke out at one of our press conferences, what it would have meant to her to have that support uh, behind her from the state of Connecticut. And we have done that. We've given the people something they very much needed. And for me, uh, it makes this experience so worthwhile. So for all of the people who advocated for this, all of the people who worked to make it happen, to our governor who signed this bill into reality, um, and to the authority that has done such an outstanding job standing up the program, I thank you because you have given something to the state of Connecticut, to the working families of Connecticut that we've needed for a very long time. And so this is an exciting moment, an exciting day, and I want to be back here the day that we pay out the first benefit. <laughs> Oh, and now I'd like to introduce uh, State Representative Robin Porter. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Thank you all for being out here. I mean, it's all been said. I won't belabor the issue. I really want to say how grateful I am to the team. That I will reiterate. Um, everyone that had their hand on the plow as we got this through, and now to see it actually being birthed is phenomenal. <laughs> the lives that we are touching, like the that. lives we are changing. I like yes, that. I believe in birth and promises, and this was a promise, as Senator Kushner said, that was instilled a long time ago. And to see it come to fruition is just, there's no words for it. The difference that this will make in people's lives, especially workers. This is a fully funded, 100% funded by the employee. And we're talking about improving worker retention, worker morale, we're talking about improving physical and, and, and mental health care for them and giving them the real choice, the right that they should have had from the very onset to have paid time off when they are going to be taking care of either themselves, a child, uh, a military family member that's been injured, an organ donor, the things that we don't really think about that impact people on their daily in their lives. So I just really am grateful to be a part of this coalition to be a part of this team, and I want to thank every member of that team that made this dream a reality, and a special thank you to the governor and the executive branch. Thank you, and God bless you all for being here. And now I'd like to introduce Janae Woods Weber, who leads the Connecticut Women's Educational and Legal Fund. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Janae Woods Weber. I am the Executive Director for the Connecticut Women's Education and Legal Fund. We lead the Campaign for Paid Family Leave, a coalition of more than 75 organizations that fought for and won passage of paid family and medical leave in 2019. Today, today's a great day because we are one step closer to making paid family and medical leave a reality in our state. Starting today, workers can finally begin to have peace of mind in knowing that when they need time away from work, paid family and medical leave will be there for them. We are proud of Connecticut's leadership in adopting one of the most comprehensive paid leave programs in the nation. And just over a year before the COVID-19 crisis struck, this illustrated to all of us just how critical this policy is to workers and their families. Now, almost two years into this pandemic, when workers need to care for a seriously ill family member or for themselves, paid family and medical leave will be there for them. Paid family medical leave will also be there for them during moments of happiness, such as when they are welcoming a new child into their family, whether by birth, foster care, or adoption. It's also important to note that Connecticut is the only state whose paid leave law allows for paid time off for issues related to family violence, up to 12 days in the calendar year. As the federal government continues to debate a national policy, we are at the forefront here in our state and we are sending a clear message. We are saying that paid leave works, it is feasible, and as a nation, we won't rebuild from this crisis without it. And frankly, as a nation, we are way behind the times on this issue compared to our peer countries. Thank you to Andrea and her amazing team at the Paid Leave Authority for their persistence and incredible work to bring us this milestone. We especially applaud their hard work in making sure this program stayed on time despite the challenges presented by the pandemic. Connecticut's workers have been paying into this program for almost a year. 
Now we must dig into ensuring that all workers know about their rights and understand what's available to them under this new law and how they can receive the paid benefits they need and deserve. Thank you. So that concludes our conference today. I, again, I would really like to thank you for being here as we launch this really important part of our program. Uh, I'm going to ask Jessica Vargas, who works with our agency. Jessica has some handouts, it's just the one actually, that, is, that are the five ways in which a person can apply for paid leave benefits, and I encourage you to take one and share them, the if you can do that so, you can, exactly <laughs> so, you, so that you can, you can spread the word. Yeah. We are delighted to be able to offer this opportunity to the workers of the state of Connecticut, and we thank you for, your opportunity, for the opportunity to be here and your cooperation, and I think we're open for questions, yep. if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yes, so we are. Right. So it, they will get a decision for, uh, five days after they have submitted all of their documentation. And so documentation can take up to 30 days for people to gather because you have to go to your physician, your health care provider, get a medical certification. If you're adopting a child, there's certain uh, criteria that you need to meet and documentation that you need to bring. But once you've submitted everything, you'll have a decision as to whether or not your, leave, your, leave, your paid leave benefits are approved within five days. No, so workers will be applying on their own with the five ways that, that Jessica will share. The employer will be required to fill out an employer employment verification form, which is part of the welcome packet that employees will get. And that will allow us to know where they're working, how much they're getting paid, so that when we calculate the benefit, we'll have the right amount. And that the employer is aware that the person is taking leave. Because what we don't want is for people to come directly to the paid leave authority, take leave, and then be missing from work, and their employer is wondering where they are. That's, that's really not the point. So the, it, it's a cooperative relationship between the employer and the employee and the paid leave authority. Does that mean that they have to get permission from the employer? No, that's an interesting question. It does not mean that they have to get permission. And so I will, and I'm a lawyer, so I will just, I will tell you, I could get really deep and difficult, but I will not do that. <laughs> so what I will tell you is that when, a, <laughs> that when a person applies for family and medical leave, they have the option of coming to the paid leave authority to be paid for the time that they're away. And so the employer has to approve the family and medical leave. But if a person wants to come directly to the pay leave authority and apply for their benefit, they may do so. But again, we'll be encouraging them to go back and have that conversation with their employer that they've applied for that leave and that they need to make sure that they have a job to come back to because that's really the point. But there are protections under the law. There are. Under the statute. Yeah, that's, that's the family and medical leave part that I can talk about. Yes. Clarify, today's the first day that they can sign up. The benefits are not going out until next, the start of the next year. That's right. So today is the first day you can apply for benefit. Benefits are not payable until January of 2022. Do you have any estimates for, like, on a monthly basis, how many people are going to be signing up? We don't. I can, as I mentioned this morning, we have about 500 people. We're halfway through the day. So we did think we'd get between 1,000 and 1,500 people applying daily um, for benefit. And we knew that it would start in the beginning much higher, and then it would level off as time went on. But we're about where we think we would be today. So I'm trying, this is employee. Yes. Um, is it through payroll deduction? It is through payroll deduction. It's uh, half a percent of the FICA wage number. Yeah. Well, it all depends on your employer's policies. So it, if, if, for example, your employer has, if you've accumulated a lot of time off, your employer can either ask you to or they can require you to use some of that time to cover part of or all of the time you're away. But they are required to allow you to keep two weeks of your, your paid time off so that, as Senator Kushner mentioned earlier, there were so many stories of people exhausting all of their leave and then not having an opportunity to attend a really special family event. So the, this change in the law will actually eliminate that very poor outcome for people. And I heard someone ask me a question about how people are paid. Are you asking about the additional, or how people are paid for their benefit at all? They do. So once their benefit is approved, they will receive notice, and their employer will also receive notice if they've been approved, and they will also 
uh, indicate the amount of money that they're being approved for. Payments, benefit payments will be made in only two ways, either on what's known as a, a debit card or a stored value card or directly to a bank account. And we've learned this from other states who have said to us, if you can avoid checks, do so, because they're one of the highest ways that fraud occurs. So there will not be checks that will be issued. Yeah, so there are, you would think that's an easy question to answer, right? But <laughs> they're estimated. estimated. We would say probably about 50,000 or more people have already contributed to the fund. It's probably much higher than that, but I want to get you an exact okay, number. Employees, employees. Employees. It's, it's much higher than that. Yeah, it's probably closer to 200,000. Yeah, but I want to get you the exact number. Okay. Sure, Claire, absolutely. So what percentage of the employee's check is reimbursed to them, is paid through this program? All right, that's an excellent. So what Claire asked me is, well, actually, what's the benefit amount? If you make at or below minimum wage, the benefit amount is 95% of your base weekly wage. Wow. Right. Excellent. If you make more than that, is a much more complex formula that we really don't have time for today. But the maximum that you can get is is 60%, 60 times the prevailing minimum wage. So right now that would be $780 a week. So back to your question earlier, so you asked your question earlier. If you have employee employer benefits, we will pay whatever it is that you're entitled to based on your the wage information we have. And then you can go to your employer and ask them to supplement the difference, whether that's in paid time off that you may have available or a short-term disability policy. And it all depends on each employer, which is why I don't have a specific answer for you. But people can go to their employer and ask for additional resources to bring them up to as close to their wage that they would normally receive as possible. So you're saying it applies first and then the employer directly? Yes. Right. That's how it works for most employers. That's how, they're, that's how they're doing it. Some employers are doing it differently. They're asking people to use their time first and then come to the paid leave authority, which they can ask an employee to do, but it's their, it's their benefit, so they can certainly choose to come to the paid leave authority first. I want to get what to the right number. Like, oh, what does that mean for the solvency? Oh, oh no, there's okay. So there's not. Let me first of all, let me get you the right number of the number of people. The reason that this answer is so hard to give you is because many people pay their contributions through a third-party administrator. So really large employers don't necessarily give us the number of employees that they're paying for. They will say we are paying for 50 employers, and they're really large employers. So we don't always get that number. That's why I'm telling you. So we're estimating what the number is. But I can tell you that today we have $300 million in the trust fund. And at the end of January, we'll have about $410 million in the trust fund. We recently had an actuarial analysis that tells us that even five years from now, the trust fund is solvent. So we're not concerned about running out of money. We are not. She says, say it again. OK. <laughs> All right, our most recent actuarial analysis tells us that even with high usage, five years from now, the trust fund remains solvent, so we are not concerned about running out of money. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you.